Welcome to lecture 22 of ECE 4305 Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we'll look at the concept of water filling. So as we saw in lecture 15, there are a number of advantages that multi-carrier modulation possesses over other forms of data transmission. Uh, this is due in part to its divide and conquer strategy in terms of how it reorganizes data across time and frequency in order to handle potentially um, a, a dispersive channel environment that it must operate across. So for instance, by restructuring the high-speed data input into a collection of n subcarriers, each with one nth the data rate, right? One nth the, the bit period, and, th and thus a much longer symbol period, um, the multi-carrier receiver is able to handle channel dispersion um, potentially on a per subcarrier basis in a much more effective manner. And because of this sort of divide and conquer approach, um, in addition to getting uh, to obtaining sim uh, simpler equalization techniques that can be applied per subcarrier, um, it also allows us to uh, look at uh, multi-carrier modulation in other ways. Um, including um, treating the impairments in, introduced by a channel not necessarily across the entire transmission band but on a per subcarrier basis and and this is really powerful um, as we'll see in the example uh, uh, that I'll draw right now. So recall how multi-carrier modulation looks like from the frequency domain. So across frequency what we would have is essentially a collection of these subcarriers or subchannels as some people call them. And we know that spectrally this has a sort of sync pulse appearance to them, but we won't draw the side lobes because that will take forever. Okay. So what happens is this multi-carrier modulation has a subcarrier and there are a collection of them. So we have n subcarriers. Okay. And so what this this is great because what ends up happening is suppose at the same time, let's say I'll draw in another color. We have this or sort of channel profile, right? So let's say this is C of F. That's my channel frequency response. And this is good to know because what ends up happening is how do we get the signal to noise ratio? How do we get SNR? Well, SNR, okay, let's say it's gamma, is going to be equal to um, the power, power spectral density across F times the magnitude squared of the channel frequency response divided by the noise power spectral density, right? So what ends up happening is our SNR is actually going to be different for every subcarrier because if you look, let's say the subcarrier here has some pretty low, like a lot of attenuation by this um, this this uh, channel frequency response, assuming that the noise spectral density and the power spectral density of the transmitter are constant. While at this end, we have a substantially higher signal noise ratio because the attenuation is less by the channel frequency response. So as a result, what multi-carrier modulation does, like OFDM, like I've drawn here, is we can break up each uh, the break up the channel into sort of these morsels of frequency, right? We have, let's say, this attenuation as opposed to here, and every one of these guys will look at the transmission channel differently, and we can treat each subcarrier differently with different equalization techniques, different modulation, and different transmit power. So given this divide and conquer strategy that is inherent in the structure of how multi-carrier modulation is performed, we and 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 noticing how we can almost treat each subcarrier on an individual basis this sort of now forms a foundation of uh, of several approaches to try and attempt to tailor every subcarrier in order to sort of optimize across the entire transmission uh, one or more uh, possible performance metrics so, so in order to get a better understanding on um, how to approach this optimization of a multi-carrier transceiver, let's 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 recall Shannon capacity. Okay, so in equation one over here, we have Sh Shannon capacity's expression, right? In an AWGN channel where the capacity is equal to the bandwidth of the channel log base two 
one plus the signal to noise ratio of the channel that we're operating across divided by that same bandwidth. Okay, so given this expression, let's 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 uh, look at this a little bit more carefully and imagine this from the perspective on a subcarrier. Okay, so so an OFDM symbol, we, a signal, we can look at the entire transmission bandwidth, or suppose we look across every delta F, which is the subchannel or subcarrier bandwidth and calculate the individual capacities of each subcarrier, okay? What we get is equation two, where the capacity of subcarrier I or subchannel I is equal to the bandwidth across subchannel I, log base two, one plus the signal to noise ratio of subchannel I divided by the bandwidth subchannel sub I. And, and so how do we get the signal to noise ratio? of subchannel I, well that's going to be equal to PFI, which is the power spectral density across subchannel I, times the magnitude squared of the channel attenuation or channel frequency response CFI, which is the channel frequency response across delta uh, F, across that subchannel I, divided by um, SNNFI, which is the power spectral density of the noise. So what we've got is the transmit power PFI times the amount of channel attenuation that is exposed to the signal, which will obviously reduce that transmit power such that the receive power is much less, divided by the noise power, and then, of course, the bandwidth delta F, right? So as a result, if we write, rewrite that capacity expression on a per subchannel basis, this is what we get. Now, if we put it all together, into a single global approach. So let's sum across all n subchannels or subcarriers such that we get expression three. What we end up getting, okay, so if we if we we get an overall capacity of that transmission. But I'm not happy yet because so far we have n subcarriers and we can take this all the way to a, uh, to, uh, from a discrete perspective where we have a discrete number of subchannels or subcarriers, suppose we had the power to deploy a, an infinite number of subchannels with an infinitely narrow bandwidth for every subchannel, what we can get is a continuum of values. So an infinite number of subchannels, now we go from summation of, of cross n subchannels to an integral expression across a continuum of bandwidth w, and that's where we get equation four. And then if we impose a total power constraint, because uh, what we want to avoid is um, having an unlimited number of power because uh, we want to avoid sort of like large concentrations of power in the spectrum. That's not really good for, especially for out of band emissions and such. So we impose a total power constraint. How much is, how much total power that the transmission can have? And that's an express in equation five. And then what we do is we maximize and we use Lagrange multipliers, which we see here in equation six with the lambda PF. How much power can we transmit across the entire frequency band? And so we use calculus of variations to get equation seven that ultimately yields to us that the total power allocation across frequency, assuming a continuum of subcarriers, is going to be equal to equation eight. And what does equation eight tell us? It looks like equation eight tells us that we want to put power, if you notice, we have some sort of constant K, subtract from it the power spectral density of the noise across the frequency divided by the magnitude squared of the channel frequency response. So it's almost like we're trying to invert the channel frequency response and, and, and divide the, the noise power spectral density by it and then subtract that off from some constant K. So what we're going to get at the end of the day is some sort of shaping, if you will, of the transmit power to counteract the attenuation caused by the channel frequency response. In other words, the resulting expression for this PF is for signal power, it's going to be high when the channel signal to noise ratio is high and then vice versa when it's low, when the channel SNR is low. And what's going to look like is essentially like we're filling in the sort of the dips in the, um, the, the, the profile of the 
uh, channel frequency response, we're filling in the dips with additional transmit power to overcome them, as we're going to see right now. Okay, so how would this water filling look like? So let's draw in the following. So suppose in the frequency domain, I'm trying to represent what this noise power spectral density divided by the magnitude squared of the channel frequency response. And what you'll see is something that looks like this. Let's just say. All right. So let's say that is the value of this function or this ratio. So what this, what this um, uh, uh, expression says, like in order to, uh, to fill um, or in order to satisfy PF, right? Remember that PF is equal to K, some constant minus this ratio. And what this is equivalent to is essentially filling those dips, if you will, the sort of the really low portions of that ratio with additional power. Right? And so this here, it's ironic that I'm using blue as a color, is our water level. And the entire process for, perf for performing sort of this, ad putting additional transmit power in those specific dips in the power noise power spectral density divided by the magnitude squared of the channel frequency response, this process is referred to as water filling because just like you would fill a pot um, or a basin with water, you're filling this profile also with transmit power. 